first of all, does it even matter when we apply? This is a question that we get all the time. Does it matter? Well, you know, John, should I apply round one? Should I apply round two? Should I apply round three? Okay, well, here we are. It is, uh, we're about one-third of the way through the month of November. Okay, so if you applied round one, great. Congratulations. We'll talk about that a little bit. Okay. Um, but as everyone knows, round two deadlines are going to hit right around the beginning of January. Okay, good. So you've got about uh, two months to get your round two applications in. That's plenty of time. Okay, here's all that matters. All that matters today in terms of round strategy is that round three is a total, total disaster. Okay, we cannot apply round three. Uh, we'll, we'll talk just a little bit about it, but sitting here today, does round strategy matter? No. All that matters is round two is what all of us need to shoot for. Do not plan for round three. Round three is a total, total disaster. All right, but don't just take my word for it. Um, we have some quotations uh, from the deans of admissions. You know, these guys come and they go, uh, so we, we, we can't put too much uh, emphasis on what the guys are saying, but here's Bruce Delmonico from Yale SOM. We advise people to avoid the third round. All right, here's J.J. Uh, Cutler, who's the Deputy Vice Dean of Admissions at Wharton. Our ability to make decisions in the third round is different than in the first round. If you're serious, you should apply round one or round two. So what's the point? The point is here we are. Okay, it's November 11th or November 12th, depending on where you are in the world. Um, all that matters is uh, do not apply round three. Round three is not an option. Okay, I, I hope that we've made that very clear. Okay, just so you understand a little bit about uh, why this is true, here's a quotation from the dean over at Tuck. You know, this is something that a lot of people forget. Uh, admissions people are people. By the time you get to the 200th investment banker, you get a little bit bored. You know what I mean? You sort of want to end your life. Uh, it's, it's tedious work pouring through thousands and thousands of applications. Right? Some schools will get 2,000 applications in one round. Okay? That's, that's a lot of work. Okay? Um, by the time you get to the 200th investment banker or the 200th uh, real estate developer or the 200th guy from China, it gets tiring. So yes, the sooner you get your application in, the better. However, round one has passed, so here we are. Okay. Why else is round three a bad idea? Well, because it, it raises the obvious question, dude, you're late. <laughs> you're late. Why are you late? Okay, now you need to answer to that. Right? I, I, think, I think you're late because you're not motivated. I think you're late because you missed the ball. Drop the ball. Missed the bus. Okay, I think you're late because you were too busy, you know, watching Jurassic Park. Like, you know, watching pterodactyls walk across the stream. Okay, that, that's why I think you were late. Prove to me that there's a good reason why you're applying round three. Okay, by the way, if you're an international student, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, Round three is even worse. All right, this is the last we're going to talk about round three, then we're going to focus a little bit on round two. Okay, what candidates can apply round three? You know, if you decide, you know what, screw it. I missed round two, but I'm going ham. I'm going to apply round three. The answer is that yes, that is possible. Okay, let's take this guy, for example, ja Jasper. He's a hipster farmer. You know, round three is a chance for schools, for the most part, uh, to fill their, their classes with interesting, unusual people, right? By this time, you've got all of your investment bankers. By this time, you've got all of your consultants, right? You've got maybe 10%, maybe less than 10% of your class to fill. So who are you going to fill it with? With another banker? No. Maybe this is your chance uh, to find somebody interesting, to find somebody unusual. Okay, like this dude, Jasper, for example. All right, he's a farmer. We have worked with farmers in the past. There's a chicken farmer we've worked with. Uh, true story. Okay, what, what, what's another good reason to apply for round three? Well, 
I don't know, what if you're an entrepreneur and, and what if you're raising money and you can't leave? Okay. I buy it. Round three. All right? What if you're about to get a big promotion? What if there's a big deal? You know, maybe you have a lot of responsibility. Right? But, uh, maybe. You could argue that. Listen, uh, why did I have to, why did I miss round two? Well, because I was traveling a lot and I have a lot of responsibility and for me to leave and to focus on applications during that time would be too difficult. Okay? I mean, I, listen, I get it. You know, we're, uh, if we're 25 years old, it's not like we are, um, I guess the point is you want to make the point that you have a lot of responsibility. You may not be the king of England, right? We are not royals or whatever, but yes, I have responsibility. Yes, that's why I applied round three, so yes, it's appropriate. Okay, also personal reasons, right? Maybe I was sick. Maybe my mom was sick, right? I had to take time off. Fair enough. Good reasons to apply round three. But guess what, you guys? It's 10% maximum that are accepted during round three. Okay, so where does that leave us? It leaves us round two. Here we are, making the most of round two. All right, we'll talk a little bit about round one. Let's focus on round two. Well, listen, there's good news and there's bad news. Right? We always like to say the bad news first. First of all, uh, most applications will be submitted during round two. Maybe this is a bad thing. According to Ross, it's 55% of the total. That's a pretty big number. Okay? According to Wharton, this is when applications are the most intense. Okay? So, you know, more competition is going to make it harder to get in. Fair enough. Okay, why else? Well, because it's true. Some of the slots have been taken already. Okay, especially if you are um, an international student. You know, how many people is Stanford going to take from China? I don't know, five, ten? You know, and if they've got five amazing Chinese people already, well, crap. You know, you're down to just a few spots left. So, yes, yeah, some spots have been taken. Okay. Here's another problem, something that you guys may not have thought through yet. Uh, you know, right now it's November 11, it's November 12, easy. Uh, but guess what? In two weeks, guys, it's going to be Thanksgiving, right? In a, a, a month and a half, it's going to be Christmas and New Year's. Take it from me. I'm going to be working during Christmas and New Year's, but, but I'm used to it, you know? Uh, if you're applying round two, you're going to be stuck doing applications during your vacation. Okay, that sucks. All right, this is a con. Okay, now some schools, for example, are obsessed with early applications. Okay, why is that? Well, um, Columbia, for example, they have early decision. Right, I'll tell you a story about myself. I, I applied to Columbia. This is back in you know the 1800s or whatever. But back when I was applying, uh, from <coughs> excuse me. Uh, back when I was applying to business school, um, I applied to Harvard, I applied to Stanford, I applied to Wharton, I applied to Kellogg, I applied to Columbia, all of these places. Right Now, I got into all of them with one exception. I applied to all of them, by the way, in round two. You know, I got waitlisted at Columbia. You know, this is, this is a little bit unusual. Okay, why did I get waitlisted at Columbia but get into Harvard and get into Stanford? You see, my dad was horrified. My dad, so you know, is a professor at Columbia, okay, plus he's an alum, plus my sister's an alum. We are a Columbia family, okay? We're, we're friends of Columbia, right? Um, but here's John Frank. He gets into Harvard, but he gets waitlisted at Columbia, all right? So my dad calls them, this is a true story, okay? My dad calls them up. My dad says, hey, guys, what the hell is going on? You know, we're all supposed to be friends, right? I mean... Dion Warwick said it, that's what friends are for, right? How come John Frank, my son, did not get in, and we are a Columbia family, and he's qualified to get into Harvard and Stanford? And that was when I learned a valuable lesson, okay? That lesson was um, that Columbia is 100% absolutely obsessed with early decision. She explained 
they will accept up to 50% of their class early. Forget round one. They will accept 50% of their class early. Okay? Wow. That is a tough one. That's a big number. 50% early. Okay, so listen, it's a con. Yeah, if you're applying to Columbia and you haven't submitted yet, I'll tell you what, I don't think you're going to get in. All right? All right, what else? It isn't just that there are more applications coming in. It's that actually, in some ways, these applications are even better qualified. They're even better qualified. Okay, why is that? Well, because initially, round one came along. Some people applied, and they got in. Great. They're very, very smart. They're off in, you know, Bermuda wearing Tommy Bahama shorts. They're very happy. Okay, but for the people who did not get in, uh, those guys are now applying round two. And some of those guys are really well qualified. Some of those guys are really well qualified. Right? They didn't get into Harvard and Stanford, but they're still perfectly qualified for Columbia, Wharton, Ross. Right? Those guys are now in this pool of people. Okay? So that's tricky. So here we are. Right now, everybody, you know, not just uh, the new, the 55% of new guys, but it's, it's also the people from round one who didn't get in, who are now with you eating from the same dog bowl. All right. So anyway, clearly, yes, there are some cons to applying round two. Okay, here's another con of applying round two. All right, reapplications are very difficult now. All right, reapplications are uh, not recommended for round two applications. Why? Well, because if you're interested in round two, um. Or rather, if, if you're interested in a school and you didn't get in last year, what, why couldn't you get your act together to get your application in in October? Right? I don't get it. If I was dinged by Harvard, but Harvard's the only school for me and I'm going to spend the next nine months getting in, blah, 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 what, why am I applying as a reapplicant to Harvard in round two? Okay, a definite problem with round two is that if you're applying as a reapplicant, it's tricky. Is it possible? Yes, of course it's possible. You know, it's possible to read a Maya Angelou book in two hours and not break down into tears. Um, but it's very, very hard. Okay, reapplications are hard in round two. All right, so those are the cons. Now, again, here we are, right? It's November 11. The first thing I said, maybe the most important thing that I'm going to say today is avoid round three. Okay? Avoid round three. Okay? So uh, are there some pros? Are there some cons? Yes. Uh, let's talk about pros. Here we are. We have to apply. We have no choice. So what are the pros? Well, the pros are you have more time. So you have more time. Let's say that you want to uh, go into uh, a, a very, very specific business. I don't know. What's the business? Um, Say, you, I don't know, you want to make, you know, dinosaur action figures. You've been obsessed with the pterodactyl since you were a kid, and you want to make, you want to be a manufacturer of dinosaur action figures. Okay, well, guess what? You know, I know that Ross has a great manufacturing program. Okay? Ross has a great manufacturing program. So now you have a little bit of extra time. So go to Ross, visit, introduce yourself to the director of the manufacturing program. Okay, say, hey, you know, uh, my name's John, I'm so interested, let, let me show you my sample pterodactyls. You know, I'm obsessed not only with pterodactyls and dinosaurs, but also with manufacturing. It's nice to meet you. Can you talk to me about your manufacturing program? Okay, no problem. Great. You now have time to do that. Go visit. Go visit. All right, you have more time to network. Right? Everyone's going to run out of time. Well, Tell you what, you guys, everyone on this call, you've got two months. That's a lot of time. Okay, back to the example, the manufacturing example. Get online. Get onto the Wharton network. All right? If you don't have access to it, find somebody who does. Maybe there's another guy who is just as obsessed with the pterodactyl manufacturing business as you. Okay, find that guy. Talk to him. Now in your application, 
Okay, you, you can say, hey, by the way, you know, as I wrote about in this application, you know, I'm all about the pterodactyl. And I spoke to another Wharton guy who is too, and I went and I visited, and gosh, the only place that can give me the pterodactyl resources that I so desperately need is Ross or Wharton or wherever, right? You have the chance now to make this case, which you didn't before. All right. I think we've made our point with the pterodactyl. Um, next bullet point, a, a Kellogg's admissions guy actually noted that round two is the best place to apply um, because that's where less than perfect candidates can apply. Okay, they can, and I'll, I'll explain what I mean here in a little bit, but you know, round two, or, or round one rather, is unusual. It's like uh, round one but what ends up happening with round one applications, and take it from me, I've done about 15,000 of them. Uh, in round one, what happens is you get two types of, applic two types of applicants. Okay, it's easy um, to see who's who. Okay, the first type is the guy who's just got his act together. Holy crap, that guy has got his act together. Man, this girl visited, she knows all about the pterodactyls, it's an unusual business, it's a growing business. Um, Homeboy is going to get in. Round one applicants are either very, 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 very qualified, okay, or there's like this, there's this split. If they're not very qualified, <laughs> they're like very underqualified because there are a bunch of boneheads out there who are saying, oh, it's round one. Even though I'm unqualified, I should apply anyway because it's easier. Um, okay, so in fact, round two is the chance for all the normal applicants to apply. If you don't fit into either of those two categories, if you're not great and if you don't suck, apply round two. You will be in good company and you may just get in. All right. Let's get to the last one here. I want to make sure we leave plenty of time for questions. Uh, compared to round one, fewer folks will be waitlisted. So a, a lot of those average guys that I just talked about, the guys that are in the middle, um, they're going to be waitlisted in round one. Okay, so apples to apples, if you're applying round two, um, there's more of a chance that you're not going to get waitlisted. So assuming that you're sort of on the right side of normal, uh, this is an advantage for you. If you had applied round one, you'd get waitlisted. You may or may not get in. Round two, you would get in, maybe. You know, your chances of waitlisted go down in round two, which is great. All right? You know, I was actually talking to um, a client, or I don't, he is a client, actually, a guy named Formpong from India, and uh, we were talking about this exact, this exact situation. You know, he says, oh, I was, I was waitlisted in round one. Am I going to get waitlisted again uh, in round two? And I said, Formpong, probably. You know, probably not. Fewer wait lists for sure come out of round two. You know, is this a pro or a con? I think it's a pro. Okay, but, but it's out there. All right, here's one of my favorite pictures of, of Homer Simpson and, and, and a great quotation, um, which I think is relevant here. You know, at the end of the day, you guys, and I, I think most of you know this, at the end of the day, the kids with the best applications get in. That's it. Are you applying round one or round two or even, God forbid, round three? If your application is the best, you will get in. You know, round one, you're going to fall into that category of people that get in for sure. Round two, you're in with, with the 55%, right, waving the flag, and you're like, hey, I'm with everybody else, you know, consider me. And as long as your application is good enough, you're going to get in. Right, round three, I told you it's really hard. Uh, but shit, if you're the best guy, if you're the most qualified guy, you will get in. Okay, now, of course, there are pros. Listen, if, if your application is not legit, okay, by the same token, whether you're applying round one, two, or three, <laughs> you're not going to get in, right? But at the end of the day, like Homer Simpson says, you know, green M&Ms, blue M&Ms, they all end up the same color, <laughs> right? If your application is the best, you're going to get in. If your application sucks, you won't. All right? All right. Let's move on. A note for international applicants. The truth is, 
for international applicants, round two is a bit of a disadvantage. All right, we talked about this briefly. Talked about it briefly. Um, but, you know, a class like Stanford, <clears throat> let's say there are 330 kids that are admitted per year total. 110 of them will be international. Let's just pretend it's a split 50-50 between men and women. 55 men, 55 women. How many of those men are going to be from China, for example? Or India, for example? I don't know, 10? Okay, so you're thinking to yourself, you know what, I'm going to apply to Stanford anyway, even though I'm going for one of these 10 slots. Well, guess what? Round one already passed, and five of those slots are now taken. So now you and the other 55% who are waving your flag, you know, you're, you're trying to make yourself look real good. You're, you know, you're wearing your suit, you're wearing your best jazz pants, you're writing your best essays. Um, but guess what? There's only five spots left for the entire Chinese population. Oh, no. All right, this is tricky. Are you dead? No. Well, of course you're not dead. Um, but let's be honest here. You know, your chances are not as good in round two as an international applicant as they were in round one. Okay? Well, wise Americans who are applying from America have just a little bit more flexibility there. <clears throat> okay, and by the way, when, when I say uh, Americans, this could be anybody of, uh, with, with a U.S. passport. You know, what is an American? Uh, an American, even if you were born in another country, you know, let's say, let's take a, a silly example. Let's say you're Robert Goulet, right? You were born in Italy, but you come to America um, and you have a U.S. passport. For the purposes of the application, you will absolutely be considered a U.S. resident, right? Where's your passport? That's, that's, where, that's where your application will be considered. Okay, all right, let's move on. All right, a lot of you may not know what this device to the right is here. You may see it and say, oh, it looks like something from a Transformers movie. Um, <coughs> excuse me. But in fact, that's Betamax. Now, so the question is, was it better to be round one? John, let's, let's take 100 steps back. <clears throat> is it better to be round one? At the end of the day, um, and I, I was talking to a, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, to a, uh, an, an admissions person who was very clear about this. Um, at the end of the day, uh, is there an advantage for the average guy to apply in round one? No. It's like, what does the GMAT actually show in real life? Well, they've done studies, and if you do well in the GMAT, apparently it means that you're going to do well not in life, but you're going to perform well in business school. Okay, so do I believe that the people who apply in round one will get in easier in general? No. Do I believe that they will be the ones who are more successful in business in general? No. What, what does it mean if you applied in round one? All it means is that you're really, really well prepared. It means you're really, really well prepared. Does that mean that you're going to be the best business guy? No. <laughs> a lot of great business guys are not necessarily the best organized. A lot of the most brilliant people are not necessarily the ones that submit on day one. Okay, admissions committees know this. Okay, so what? You were super, super well prepared. Okay, it doesn't matter. Okay, if the only thing that you've achieved in your life is you've managed to create your own baking tin, which allows you to bake the most delicious muffin tops, that doesn't mean that you're going to be a good businessman. Okay, great, you're good at planning, but all you can do is bake. This is not baking school, this is business school. Okay? Betamax, the reason I have this picture here is Betamax was the first to market. Okay, but they lost. They lost to VHS. Okay, being first is not necessarily the best. All right, here's another fun fact. We talked about this a little bit. 
Um, some of the statistics, you know, before I gave this presentation, I, I tried to pull together as much research as I could. You know, I've seen reports that it's two to six times as many applicants um, in round two as in round one, which is great. Uh, and it's, it's like it's like I said before, um, you know, the uh, the applicants in round one are absolutely split. There are very few sort of typical average run-of-the-mill applicants. What they are instead is sort of one or the other. You know, it's like um, super, super qualified guys that just have their acts together, um, or it's guys that thought, you know what, I, 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 I may not be qualified for the school, but man, if there is an advantage to round one, I'm going to get into it. Okay. Um, all right, so here we are. All right, so round one. Let's let's recap just a little bit. Okay, round uh, round one has passed. Today we are round two. Round three is out of the question. Okay, so it is what it is. Everyone needs to submit all of their all of their applications in round two. Done and done and done. Okay, it doesn't even matter. Is is there a special? Would round one have been better? Who cares? Does round three suck? Yes. So here we are. Round two is all that matters. Okay, for the last 15 minutes here, what I'm going to do, okay, is tell you the three things that you need to forget everything. Okay, unlearn everything that you have learned. Right? I'm going to tell you the only three things that you need to know. If you do these three things in your application, you will get in. Okay, here's the first thing. The first thing is connecting your past experiences to your future goals. Okay, if my MBA presentations were a drinking game, this would be the one that everybody would like laugh about and drink every time I said it. This is the single most important thing. This is the single most important thing. I don't care if you apply round one, I don't care if you apply round two, I don't care if you apply round three. I don't care if you want to make a movie with pterodactyls and transformers and you want the last song to be That's What Friends Are For. It doesn't matter. If you don't connect your past experiences to your future goals, you're not going to get into business school. Okay, what do I mean? John, you're, you're saying this is the most important thing, but what does it mean? I'll tell you. Um, and this, by the way, is not the grand finale. We've got, we've got another 15 minutes to go here. But here's the single most important thing. The single most important thing. Um, let's say that you have a background in... Um, <clears throat> let's stick with manufacturing. Okay? You have a background in manufacturing. You, are, uh, you make clothing for dancers. Let's call them jazz pants. All right? You are the best jazz pants producer ever. Uh, you work for the biggest pants. You work for Levi's, um, and you were just promoted. Okay, great. Now, in your MBA application, you say, when I grow up, I want to be a real estate developer. Okay, that's very, very, very challenging. How, how are we going to write a good MBA application about this manufacturing guy who wants to go into real estate? How do you do that? That's hard. How do you connect your past experiences to your future goals? If your past experiences are in manufacturing and your future experiences are uh, real estate, okay, you need to connect your past experiences to your future goals. For example, let's say you used to be in real estate finance, and when you grow up, you know you want to go into um, real estate development. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, you can use an MBA to make that connection. Sure, you can. But if like you start in IT. And you say that, like, when you graduate from business school, you want to go into nonprofit stuff? That is very, very hard to do. All right? Forget round one. Forget round two. The first thing you need to do, first thing you need to do is connect your past experiences to your future goals. Okay, here's the second thing you need to do. Right. So, uh, look, there's some great there's some great questions here that are coming in, which is fabulous. Love it. Um, <clears throat> real quick, I, I can answer a couple of these questions. Um, oh, it looks like I did already. Um, okay. Step two. Your greatest hits. 
Okay, ignore essay questions, you guys. I say this and everyone thinks that I'm smoking the crack, um, but I'm not. Ignore the essay questions. All these schools want to know is what is the coolest stuff that you have done? What's the coolest stuff that you've done? What is Michael Jackson's legacy going to be? Okay? Keep it clean, people. Keep it clean. What is Michael Jackson's legacy going to be? It's going to be his most famous songs. <clears throat> it's going to be his most famous songs. Right? It's Beat It. It's Billie Jean. It's, it's his most famous songs. What Bob Marley songs can you name? It's the ones on that album, Legend. Right? What are your greatest hits? I don't care if the application asks you, you know, hey, uh, name a time that you were a leader. Name a time that you were a follower. You know, name a time that you uh, joined a team. You know, name your biggest accomplishment. Name your biggest failure. You know, name the time that you, uh, you know, built the most impressive macaroni necklace. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter what the essay question is. Okay, your job, no matter what, is to deliver the stories that are your greatest hits. I promise you, I can tell you the same story for any of these. Hey, one time, you know, John, what, what's your biggest leadership experience? One time I moved to Iowa and I had to coordinate a team of 10 people to build a real estate development. And guess what? It worked. Nine months later, we were under construction. John, name a time that you were a follower. Well, one time I was, you know, an associate manager with a real estate company in Iowa. And even though I didn't own the company and even though I wasn't the money behind the operation, I was absolutely the one who was, uh, you know, supporting this team in a teamwork way. And sure enough, nine months later, we were under construction. Okay, if that's your greatest hit, say it. Say it, say it, say it. Okay, what are your greatest hits? If at the end of the application you have not shared your greatest hits, you're screwing it up. All right, you're screwing it up. <clears throat> I don't care what the essay questions are. What are your greatest hits? All right, that's step two. Step one is connect your past experiences to your future goals. All right, step two is what are your greatest hits? Here's step three. All right, ask for help. And this is not a commercial for Admission Auto. You know, we, we've got 100 people on this call. That's the maximum. You know, probably 99 of you will not sign up for our service, will not sign up for any service. That's just fine. Okay, but do yourselves a favor. Get help. It doesn't need to be from me. It doesn't even need to be from a paid consultant. Okay, but I got to tell you, I've been doing this a long time, and the MBA application world is a big game. Okay, it's like a it's like a chess game to me. It's 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 a strategy contest. Unfortunately, um, it is not who is the smartest. It is not who is going to be the most successful businessman ever. Steve Jobs, he's pretty successful. He doesn't have an MBA, right? Um, our COO, Lauren Herskovic, she's pretty successful. She just got promoted. She's an owner in our business. She doesn't have an MBA. You don't need an MBA to be, to be wildly, wildly successful, okay? You just don't. Okay, but here we are. We who want an MBA think that it's going to help our careers. Fine. This, getting into MBA school, is a game. I believe that somebody who has been through the process understands the game. All right. So whether you are going to pay two thousand or three thousand dollars or whatever for a consultant, which, frankly, compared to the hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars you're going to spend at business school, is a drop in the bucket. Um, or maybe it's a it's an alum. Maybe it's your dad who who is a professor at a business school or something. Get help. You know, there's no way that, that, that any single applicant knows fully well um, what his application looks like from a third-party standpoint. Get input. Get help. It doesn't have to be from me. Okay, but get help. If you do these three things, connect your past experiences to your future goals, tell your greatest hits, and get somebody really, really smart to help you, 
somebody who understands the process, you're going to get in. You're going to get in. All right, briefly, I, I will spend 10 seconds just talking about my company. You know, there, there are a lot of companies out there that do something similar to what we do. You know, of course, I believe that we're different. Um, uh, one thing for sure that is different about us is that we have packages that they're actually not that expensive. You know, a few hundred dollars, uh, and you can work with our editors, you can work with our guys. Check out the website. You know, our basic package, our junior deluxe package. Um, by the way, the Junkyard Dog and Kent Ticulvi, you know, Enrique Iglesias are not on our official lineup of um, MBAs and editors. However, check out the website. Our lineup is sick. Our lineup is insane. There is nobody who has a better lineup than we do. Okay, and it, it just it just doesn't have to cost four thousand dollars, five thousand dollars to work with us. We have affordable packages. We want to help you. We want to help you because uh, you're going to get in. And then you're going to make us look great.